This study unit provides a brief overview of the PDP-11 computer system. Consequently, it deals with some very basic concepts and features that are common to all PDP-11 systems. In this study unit, we're going to cover three major topics. We'll start out by comparing the PDP-11 with traditional computers. Next, we'll describe some of the elements or building blocks that make up a PDP-11 system. And finally, we'll show you some typical PDP-11 computer systems. Let's begin by comparing the PDP-11 with a more traditional computer system. Any computer can be divided into three main functional elements, just as we've done here. The memory element stores information. The processor has two jobs. One is to perform calculations. The other is to pass information back and forth between our other two elements. Finally, one or more input-output devices permits communication between man and machine. A traditional computer has one path, or bus, that connects the processor to memory and is called, naturally, the memory bus. A second bus connects the processor to one or more input-output devices and is called the I.O. bus. Note that the I.O. bus and the memory bus are both physically and functionally separate. In other words, an element designed for one of these buses just won't work with the other bus. For instance, an I.O. device could not be connected to the memory bus. In this traditional system, our I.O. device cannot communicate directly with memory. If the device wants to enter information into memory, the information must pass through the processor, thereby tying it up. We can solve this problem by adding a third bus between our I.O. device and memory. Because the device can now deal directly with memory, we call this bus a direct memory access, or DMA bus. However, this means that the computer system now has three separate, completely independent buses. What about the PDP-11? Well, in a typical PDP-11 system memory, the central processor and the I.O. devices communicate over a single bus in contrast to the two or three bus approach used in traditional computers. Because it is one bus, it's called a unibus. Notice the arrowhead that we've placed at each end of the bus. This indicates that elements can be continually added to the unibus in either direction. Because the unibus is a common path, it is possible for any computer element to communicate with any other element on the bus. Take a look for yourself. The arrow shows that the processor can communicate directly with memory. Also, the processor can communicate directly with the I.O. device, or vice versa. In fact, certain I.O. devices can deal directly with memory at the same time that the processor is busy doing its own job. Remember what we said about traditional computer systems? There was no way for an I.O. device to deal directly with memory unless we added an extra bus? Well, that extra bus isn't needed in our PDP-11 system. The unibus that we've been talking about actually consists of 56 lines or wires to handle address, control, and data functions. We'll talk more about these lines in the next two study units. However, now let's return to our traditional computer system. Remember what we said about traditional computer systems? An element designed for one bus just won't work with the other bus unless its interface is redesigned? Well, that's not the only drawback of multiple bus systems. Separate sets of instructions are also required. Memory reference instructions may be needed to deal with memory. Also, a separate set of input-output instructions is needed for our I.O. devices. On top of that, we need another set of arithmetic instructions so that the processor can do its necessary calculations. Unfortunately, these three sets of instructions cannot be intermixed. An I.O. instruction, for example, cannot be used with the processor or with memory. Can you imagine what this does to a programmer? He must constantly deal with three completely different sets of instructions and make certain that he doesn't mix them up, for instance, using an arithmetic instruction with memory. 
Our PDP-11 system doesn't impose such harsh requirements on the programmer. Let's see why. Instead of multiple instruction sets, the PDP-11 has only one instruction set. This is due to the fact that all devices operate off of the common unibus. That's simple enough, one bus and one instruction set. Programming a PDP-11 system is simplified because there's only one instruction set to keep track of, and it can be used with any element in the system. As an example, let's take a simple instruction like move and see how it might be used in our PDP-11 system. Basically, a move instruction is used to do just what its name implies, move data from one place to another. In this case, we're using a move instruction to move data from memory to the CPU. Now, let's take this same move instruction and use it with some other devices. Here, the move instruction transfers data from the processor into an I.O. device. Perhaps this data represents command information, so we can tell the device what task to perform, such as start, stop, or change speed. Let's look at another way of using this same move instruction. Perhaps our I.O. device has completed its job and has significant information that needs to be stored for future use. Again, we can use the same move instruction. This time it transfers information from I.O. device to the memory for storage, and we're not done yet. Sometimes we might like to know just what our I.O. device is doing. We can use this same move instruction to transfer status information from the I.O. device to the processor. As we've just seen, one move instruction can be used to transfer information between any two PDP-11 devices. Note that the instruction itself never changes, but the reason for using the instruction and the kind of data it handles differ depending on what task you're trying to perform. Now that you've seen how the PDP-11 differs from traditional computers, let's describe some of the elements or building blocks that make up PDP-11 systems. PDP-11 systems are constructed from a large number of building blocks. These blocks can be assembled in many different combinations to produce a variety of PDP-11 systems. Thus, the PDP-11 is not just one computer system, it's actually a whole series or family of computer systems. This family includes a number of 16-bit processors. Although these processors incorporate the same basic PDP-11 architecture, they do have different performance factors, such as the size of the instruction set, the speed with which these instructions are executed, and the maximum number of memory locations that the processor can address. All of our PDP-11 processors are upward compatible. In other words, programs we develop for a small PDP-11 processor can also be run on one of the medium or large processors. Each of these PDP-11 processors is supported by several types of memories and by a wide selection of input-output devices. Here are just a few of the many input-output devices that can be used in PDP-11 systems. Some of the more common input-output devices include teleprinters, paper tape readers and punches, card readers, line printers, and graphic displays. In addition, there are mass storage devices, such as disks and magnetic tape units. These devices cannot be connected directly to the PDP-11 Unibus. Each device requires an interface. This interface connects to the Unibus and handles all communications between the device and the other elements in the system. In other words, the interface converts information transmitted on the bus into data and control signals that the device can respond to. This is a typical I.O. device and its corresponding interface. The cable that you see is called an I.O. cable or a device cable because it connects this input-output device to its interface. Here's a group of I.O. devices. Reading from left to right, there's a paper tape reader punch, a teleprinter, and a deck tape. Each device requires its own set of control signals to function properly. Consequently, the interfaces for these three devices are also different. For example, the interface for our paper tape reader punch cannot be used to control the deck tape. By the way, 
Have you noticed the large flat cable that runs from one interface unit to the next? That's the PDP-11 unibus that we've been talking about. It's the only common path between our interface units, memory, and the processor. That's all we care to say about I.O. devices in this first study unit. So now let's take a look at PDP-11 memories. There are three basic types of memory, core, semiconductor, and read-only memory. The Unibus permits a PDP-11 system to accommodate memories with different operating characteristics, speeds, and storage capacities. Here's how PDP-11 memory is organized. Note that it's broken down into a series of storage locations, each of which holds eight bits of information. We refer to these eight bits as a byte. Each byte location in memory is given a consecutive address starting with zero. Okay, that seems straightforward enough, but the PDP-11 uses a 16-bit word. How do we get this 16-bit word? Well, to obtain words, we combine pairs of bytes as shown here. Thus, each PDP-11 word consists of a byte with an odd address and a corresponding byte with an even address. Note that the bytes on the left always have a higher address than the bytes on the right. Therefore, odd addressed bytes are called high bytes, and even addressed bytes are called low bytes. Because of this addressing structure, we can select just a low byte, or just a high byte, or the full word. This increases the power of our PDP-11 instruction set, since many of the instructions can operate on bytes as well as on words. In our basic PDP-11 system, we use a 16-bit address. This gives us approximately 32K of possible word addresses or up to 64K of possible byte addresses. Not all of these addresses are used for memory. As we've indicated here, 4K of word addresses are reserved for registers located in our I.O. interface and in the CPU. The remaining 28K of word addresses are available for memory locations. Some of our PDP-11 systems can use an expanded 18-bit address. This expanded address is available when the computer system is equipped with memory management hardware. With an 18-bit address, the system can accommodate up to 128K words or 256K bytes. Note that we still must reserve 4K of word addresses for our I.O. and CPU registers. That leaves us with 124K words of addressable memory. That's all we care to say about PDP-11 memory at this time. However, in a later study unit, we'll cover memory and addressing in considerable detail. Now that we've concluded our discussion of PDP-11 processors, I.O. devices, and memories, let's take a look at some typical PDP-11 systems. The PDP-1103 is a small, low-cost member of the PDP-11 computer family. Despite its small size, the 1103 is a full-fledged computer capable of executing all of the basic PDP-11 instructions. The next step upward in the PDP-11 family of computers is the 1104. This 16-bit minute computer is used primarily for dedicated applications, such as patient monitoring or process control. If additional computer performance is necessary, the PDP-1134 is a possible solution. Although it is classified as a mini-computer, the 1134 can handle multiple task applications, such as a time-sharing system where several users are interacting with the computer. The 1170 is a larger, more powerful computer in the PDP-11 family. Features such as extremely fast throughput, cache memory, and the ability to access up to two megawords of main memory enabled the 1170 to accommodate many different tasks on a concurrent basis. Some of these tasks could involve interactive time sharing, while others involve batch processing or real-time processing. We've taken a brief look at four members of the PDP-11 computer family. These and other PDP-11 computers will be discussed in more detail in a later study unit. In subsequent study units, we'll also cover PDP-11 hardware and programming in much greater detail.
Before going on to these study units, we recommend that you first review the material contained in your workbook, or even play back portions of this unit. When you hear the next tone, shut off the playback unit and refer to the workbook that accompanies this study unit. After you've reviewed the material in this workbook, proceed to the next study unit in this series.